I'm Dr. Gary Krause, neurosurgeon and founder of the Krause TBI Institute in Houston, Texas. The Krause TBI podcast video provides knowledge and education about traumatic brain injury and makes the invisible side of mild TBI visible. We all utilize every day what is likely one of the most complex machines in the universe, the brain. Let's try to understand how we work. We're dedicated to creating videos and podcasts to deepen learning, and we'll have on our show clinicians, researchers, scientists, and those who have themselves suffered a mild TBI. We're each shaped by our experiences in life. My experience as a neurosurgeon is that I've operated on a large uh, number of patients who have had lesions in the brain, whether they be hemorrhages, tumors, aneurysms. But every time I open the skull to get to the brain, I can't help but be in awe of what I'm seeing. I'm seeing something that looks like tissue. The brain is about three pounds of tissue sitting inside the skull and floating in spinal fluid. And that's what I'm operating on is tissue. But can I even imagine that this particular area is creating language? This can make uh, me understand, not understand, move my right side, remember things from elementary school. How does that all happen? This is Every time I see the brain, I'm just mesmerized by this. It's beyond our imagination. But what we're going to try to do is together explore this, put together anatomy and function. How does that translate into emotion, intelligence, personality, interactions? Let's try to work together, put this all together, and understand a little bit better about how our brain works. In order to understand how the brain works, Let's break it down to its simple components. The brain is essentially a three pound piece of flesh, which is housed in a hard box known as the skull. It's floating in a water-like substance known as cerebrospinal fluid, which protects it. And the brain has never seen the outside world. It doesn't see objects. It doesn't, it's not exposed to air sounds, but yet that is the, organ in our body that is us that is able to perceive and sense the entire world around us. And when I say that the brain is us, what I mean is the brain is essentially our emotion, our feeling, our ambition, our passion, our joy, our sadness, our knowledge. Everything about us is the brain. And when we see a person, yes, we see an entire individual. We see their size, their shape, are they male, female, hair, other aspects, but this is all external representation. That entire person really is the three pounds of tissue sitting within the skull. That is the actual person. And that's important for each of us to recognize because as I say, if we injure a foot, we're the same person, but we've injured a foot. We herniate a disc in the back, we're the same person. We have a herniated disc, but if we injure the brain, we're a different person. The brain is who we are. What I'd like us to dive into in detail here is what actually comprises the brain? How does this three pound organ, which is not exposed to any, out, any of the outside world directly, know everything about the outside world, process information at every level, allow us to interact and allow us to think? What is all of that? As a neurosurgeon, I've been called to operate on the brain many, many times. Sometimes for trauma, for tumors, for hemorrhages in the brain, various reasons. But every time I open the brain, I'm just mesmerized in awe that from this three pounds of tissue, the brain is soft. It's got a little bit of a firm texture. Once you actually cut into it, it's a very soft, almost like a toothpaste type of texture. But from this comes who we are, it's beyond our wildest imaginations. And that within that substance of inside a toothpaste type of material, that we can have memories, comprehension, language, movement, speech, understanding, emotion, fear, comprehension, panic, happiness, joy. It's beyond possibilities. So I may go in and take out a hemorrhage in the brain, which is pressing on the brain, uh, maybe causing potential death and try to alleviate uh, that issue. Or I may take out a tumor or cut into the brain to get to deep regions of the brain. I'm 
operating at the scales of millimeters and centimeters. But to give an idea of the magnitude of the brain, let's dive a little deeper. The brain has about 100 billion neurons, possibly up to 100 billion glial cells. Those are the connecting uh, cells and also they wrap around and they put structure to the brain and they insulate some parts of the neurons called the axons. It has in one cubic millimeter, which is perhaps the size of a grain of sand, 100,000 neurons, 900 million synapses or connections within that one cubic millimeter, possibly the grain of a sand. The speed of processing of the brain, if it were able to be calculated, is estimated to potentially be at 52 quadrillion bits per second. That's 52,000 trillion bits per second. Incomprehensible to us. There's nothing on the uh, planet that we know, no man-made device, no man-made computer that can ever touch the sophistication of this. Yes, I understand we're talking about artificial intelligence. We're trying to get uh, better and better, but the brain is something which we're trying to understand, but we have just scratched the surface of understanding this complex structure. And not only that, but it's constantly improving and changing itself. It does its best to react to injury. I must say that every time I would operate on the brain, I cannot get past the awe of the complexity. And when I have to take out a lobe of the brain for a hemorrhage or tumor or do other uh, work on the brain, I can't but wonder, what am I affecting? Was this a memory? Was this an emotion? Where is it stored? Certainly, we don't store images in the brain like a JPEG on a computer. How do we remember things? How is all this put together? That's what we want to explore in greater detail. So for us to get an understanding a little bit further about what the brain is, let's understand that we have five senses. Sight, taste, sound, smell, and touch. That's how we can understand the outside world. Now, again, the brain is sitting in a closed box. And I use these terms a little um, casually, but I really would like us to recognize truly what this is. The box is the skull, is the head, but we have the brain sitting in a dark cavity, a dark box. It doesn't see the outside world. It has 25 inputs into it. There are 12 nerves called cranial nerves that go directly to the brain. And there are one on each side, so 2 times 12 is 24. And there's the spinal cord. The spinal cord comes up, uh, connects everything from our body, and goes into through the bottom of the skull into the brain. Again, just to put this in context, the spinal cord is maybe half an inch or so roughly in diameter in in the neck. And all of the information passes from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain, mostly through that half an inch diameter cord. The density, it's beyond our our comprehension. But let's get back to the brain itself. So for me to see something, my brain again, it's sitting in a dark box. It doesn't see the outside world. When light hits the back of my eye, the retina, it causes an electrical impulse to be sent. So it goes there through an optic nerve into the uh, brain it goes into part of the what's called the thalamus, the gen- lateral geniculate nucleus, and then it's sent back to my occipital lobe, to the back of the brain. This all happens instantly. Then that occipital lobe somehow senses that these impulses represent something, and it creates in my mind's eye an image of an object. And that's how I see the world. Now, again, I know I'm not a pilot. I don't have an instrument license. I don't have a non-instrument license as a pilot. But I know if people do fly, they first get their visual conventional license, then they get instrument rated. And for them to get an instrument rating, I understand they fly with an instructor and they put basically uh, some sort of a cover over their head so they can't see the outside of the plane. But they have to use instruments to detect where the plane is, its pitch, its roll, its turning, ascending, descending. So basically they have to retrain their brain, but still ultimately we want to rely on our vision for the most part, but that helps us. Imagine the brain. It's sitting with a cover all the time. Our eyes are just end organs sensing input from around and sending electrical signals, but our brain pieces it all together. 
and we see what we call vision. Now imagine both eyes. They're moving with just perfect symmetry. If one eye moves to the right and the other eye moves a little bit slower, we're going to see double vision. Our brain tremendously corrects that. We, we have both eyes working in perfect harmony. Next, take the uh, feeling of touch. I might have something touch my toe. There's a sensor receptor in the nerve ending in the toe that will send a signal up all the way through my spinal cord into my brain to the top of my brain. And suddenly it's recognized as something touching and it can recognize it's sharp, it's light, it's sandpaper, it's coarse, it's liquid purely by this electrical signal. Again, that three pounds of brain is sitting in a dark box. So to recognize this, how infinitely complex and miraculous this is that this even works and can work. And if anything is not working with perfection, if there's a problem in the end organ, if there's a problem in the transmission of impulses to the brain, if there's a problem in the way that the brain processes the information and sends it back and forth, that's going to completely change my perception, my analysis, and that's also how I interact with the outside world. It's going to change everything I do. If we recognize uh, another aspect of this is that all sensory information coming into the brain goes to a deep nucleus in the brain called the thalamus. That's a major relay station which takes all sensory input with the exception of smell. Uh, information coming from the olfactory tract from the nose is not sent through that. But that sense is a central relay st uh, station sending information back and forth, uh, connecting aspects of the brain, how we function, sensations in the brain. You know, when I talk about the brain, I often like to think of a city. So we're here in Houston, Texas, and Houston is a very vibrant city, but I consider it having destinations. So there are homes where people live in, there are businesses where people work, there are shopping centers, there's restaurants. But those are destinations. Nothing happens without roads connecting them all. And if it wouldn't be for the highways, the big roads, the small roads, the tiny roads, nothing would happen. If there's no connectivity, it doesn't matter how many restaurants you have. If you can't get to them, the restaurants aren't doing anything. And then the question comes, we take the city of Houston. Is Houston just a bunch of restaurants and homes and businesses just connected? Or at some point, does the vibrance of the city exceed just the sum of those parts? In other words, are we just a bunch of restaurants? Or at some point, do the restaurants and the businesses and the people and the ideas and the shopping all synergize so that the whole is greater than just the sum of the parts? Certainly, it's true with cities. Because the more types of interactions and connections you now can experience different potentials that you couldn't have just by the sum of a few. And the same in the brain. The brain, if we start out looking at the smallest level, now we can get smaller to the atoms and molecule, but we won't get that small. But if we start out just at cells, we have neurons, which are the fundamental structure of the brain. It has different components. It has a cell body. It has a long string which sprouts out from it, which we call an axon, and that can travel great distances in our body. And it has dendrites, which can also receive signals. From the neuron, we have it insulated by other cells called glial cells. We have synapses where they connect with each other. Then we have different regions of the brain, different regions of the brain, such as the frontal lobes, the occipital lobe, parietal, temporal lobes, Different lobes of the brain control different things. For instance, and this is a very simplistic approach, but the occipital lobe, the back of the brain, is vision. The frontal lobe may be movement, movement of the limbs, the arms, legs, movement of the eyes, emotion, inhibition, other aspects about personality. We have what's called parietal lobes for sensation. We have temporal lobes for uh, language, for understanding and comprehension, the frontal lobes also for speech. But none of that matters unless it's all connected in some way. So all of those are connected by white matter fibers through uh, white matter pathways in the brain. I, I call them, you can think of them as the superhighways. Some of these are long pathways, 
They go from the brain down all the way to the body through the spinal cord. Some of them are short pathways. They just go from one sulcus in the brain, one part of the brain around a little curve to the other. Some of them travel from one side of the brain to another part of the side of the brain from the front to the back. Some of them cross both sides of the brain. They all have different names, complex names, but we won't get that into that now. But the main part is that there are a tremendous number of interconnecting pathways between different parts of the brain. So then we get to another layer higher where we call large scale networks. And these now group together even larger regions of brain. They have names like default mode network, salience network, but the point is that these are much higher cognitive functioning regions and aspects uh, critical for daily survival. For instance, if there's a, uh, an alarm goes off half a mile away, I might hear that. But when I look over there, I see, oh, that's nothing that's uh, threatening to us. It's not going to jeopardize our safety. I can put it out of my mind and get back to do what I was doing and kind of drown it out in the background. Those are critical networks in the brain. Many other networks do other higher executive functioning. If I have an injury, something's not working, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be so obvious that I can't hear. It might be that I can't drown out that background noise. I can no longer focus, concentrate. There are so many higher subtle cognitive uh, aspects of the brain that are not simple. And that comes because the brain is more than just a, a bunch of destinations, but it's uh, a tremendous interaction and synergy. So just if we get back to the city, just like we said that the city of Houston is bigger than a bunch of destinations, the brain is also. The brain is much bigger than just different regions acting in different aspects. The brain, the connectivity of the brain is truly uh, a situation where the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. And one other important aspect of the brain uh, that we should recognize is that we have what are called primary areas of the brain and then secondary areas or association areas. So for instance, let's take a part of the, my brain in the parietal lobe where I might be able to uh, sense feeling of touch. So I might be able to sense touch and that's the primary sensory area but then there are association areas in which I'll be able to put that into context of things I felt in the past, contrast things, do higher level processing. The same with vision. There's a primary sensory area for vision, a primary occipital, uh, primary visual area in the back of the brain in the occipital cortex. That recognizes the primary uh, sight from when some, a light or object is shown on my retina. It sends impulses to the back to the occipital area. But then higher processing of that, seeing stereo, recognizing differences, other things with that, those happen in the association areas. So there is so much incredible complexity to all of this. I might have an injury to an association area. It doesn't mean that I'm not able to uh, anymore see something, but I might not, possibly I can't see fluid motion. Maybe it's like looking through a strobe light if my association area is off, maybe I can feel something, but I can't recognize texture, wood versus metal versus liquid. Maybe I have difficulty seeing in stereo. Maybe I have difficulty recognizing faces. Those come from different areas of the brain. So as we're talking more and more about the brain, we recognize certainly it's not such a simple uh, organ that we can just say this lobe does this, this lobe does that. And when we recognize that in one cubic millimeter, possibly the size of a grain of sand, there are a hundred thousand neurons and possibly uh, 900 million connections, it's not possible that we're going to be able to just very simply summarize uh, one task in one part of the brain versus the other. Imagine some subtle changes in this. We've come to recognize that there's something called lesion network mapping. So we discussed and we know that there are cortical regions responsible for different areas, for uh, speech, comprehension, sight. But as we also discussed, the connections, those white matter superhighways are very important. Uh, is importance is recognized now in something we call lesion network mapping, that even a lesion in the interconnecting bundles 
may be as important or even more important than a lesion in those cortical areas. Again, when we're getting back to a city, we might have some major hub, some major highway connecting huge parts of the city. We can have injury or damage to parts of the city, like homes, businesses, movie theaters, they may be shut down, but all we need is one central lesion over a major connecting pathway and suddenly everything comes to a stop. It's, it's a simple analogy just to show how the connections are critical. And again, when we get into an injury, a trauma, we have to realize it might be a severe impact, but it might not be. It might be just an acceleration, deceleration, rotation, when we're recognizing that each cubic millimeter of brain tissue, possibly the size of a grain of sand, has 100,000 neurons, how much force does it take to shear and tear some of those? If we shear and tear even a few, at what threshold are we willing to accept that? Am I willing to say that I'll accept 90,000 neurons instead of 100,000 neurons in my functioning? If I don't recognize the changes yet, is that important? We know with trauma to the brain, it's a cumulative process. So even if I suffer a mild TBI today, another one and another one may add to the problem that I can no longer compensate or function. Again, let's take the situation of the highway. A major thoroughfare passing through Houston is called the Katy Freeway, I-10. If something happens to that road, yes, there'll be a lot of problems initially, but Traffic will figure out how to get around it. Take other highways, take some side roads, eventually get around it. What happens if those other roads now are damaged? It'll get harder and harder until ultimately traffic just doesn't move. And again, it's an analogy, maybe a simplistic one, but let's apply that analogy to the brain. Even if we suffer a mild traumatic brain injury, what's called mild. It may have significant uh, consequences, but even if, we, if the consequences are subtle enough that we don't recognize them or it doesn't affect us uh, significantly, let's say there are some torn, sheared axons. Let's say if my computing power is 52 quadrillion bits, it's per second, it only dro it drops to 48 quadrillion bits. Maybe another injury drops it to 46. At some point, things will be recognizable. And that's how we really need to think about mild traumatic brain injury. We may have significant deficits that we recognize. We may have some deficits we don't recognize so well, or we may have some that we don't recognize at all. That doesn't mean that they are not there. It just means that we haven't put the body through the proper stress to detect them. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that has any kind of injury has suffered shearing, but I'm saying that uh, just because we don't see it, on an exam. We don't see it on a CAT scan. We don't see it on an MRI scan. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In my experience, sometimes it takes very detailed, lengthy evaluations and questioning of patients to discern subtle changes. There are some changes that might not uh, be uh, visible or a patient doesn't notice or the family doesn't notice till several months after an injury. It might not be till they get back to work. Maybe they're an accountant and they used to work with five, spread, five spreadsheets. Now they can only work with two. Maybe it's somebody that worked in an office with multiple cubicles and they can no longer concentrate because all of the background noise is too irritating. They can't focus. Again, these are all subtle changes in the brain. Maybe that wasn't recognized while they were at home healing, but now they're exposed to an office with multiple uh, people talking at the same time and they can't concentrate. Tremendous amount of changes can occur. And this adds to the complexity and the mystery and the miracle of the brain. But even if theoretically we were un to able to understand all of the thousands of connections and all of the cells, even in theory, where does consciousness arise? For instance, um, if I move my arm, there was somewhere in my motor strip of the brain, a motor cell, a Betz motor cell that fired, that sent a signal to a muscle in my arm to move. But what caused that uh, cell to fire? So let's say there were 5,000 connections, synapsing, connecting to those. What caused each of those? At some point, we 
get past the point, as we say, that anatomy can explain our function. That's where, as I say, where Aristotle termed at some point, we have this vitalism. He termed it an entelechy, which enters. And the question is, are we even capable of understanding the, uh, of this? So many uh, physicists have also turned to uh, theories of consciousness because it's possible that uh, we as humans are not even capable. We have other areas of physics, quantum mechanics, and string theory, etc. Theories about brains, about other dimensions, brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, as in a textbook uh, labeled Warped Passages uh, by Lisa Randall, talking about other dimensions. The question is, are we even capable? But And in summarizing, to get to really understand the brain, to understand consciousness, we understand there's anatomy, there's physiology, there's biochemistry. So there's the medical specialties. We have neurosurgery, neurology, neuroradiology, psychiatry. But then there's also psychology. We have neuropsychologists. But then to understand, and when we put together large network maps in the brain, It's sophisticated computing power. We need ultimately computer science, mathematics, big data. As we said, when we want to get into higher levels of theory about what actually caused a nerve to fire, because ultimately you would say, you could look theoretically at all of these connections and figure out what would happen unless there's some sort of consciousness, some free will that's in some, uh, somewhere there. Can we explain it based just on anatomy? Does it get into other areas of quantum physics and uncertainty? Are there other theories? So physicists have uh, turned their attention to this as well. But then we get into also philosophy and religion. So if we want to understand consciousness, we can't forget we have to incorporate also philosophy, religion, and possibly other areas as well. So it's extremely complex. The immense complexity of the brain is one of the things that actually uh, caused me to, in medical school, gain a strong interest and go into neurosurgery, uh, realizing how amazing complex it is. My undergraduate training was in physics and electrical engineering. I did some work at IBM. I did work in uh, some hardware and software design. And So I'd always been amazed at, at the time, the -the state-of-the-art mainframe computer was the 3081 computer. And I was always amazed at these cables of uh, fibers, uh, incredible coming out, in and out, and just thinking that, what an incredible machine. But as I said, when we think about the metrics of the brain, nothing on this planet, and who knows, possibly in the universe, can compare in complexity and performance of the human brain. And when we think about it, it's just uh, miraculous that things don't go wrong more often. The compensation mechanisms of the brain, the ability of the brain to try to reroute signals, synaptogenesis, potentials of neuroplasticity, healing, etc. Those are very powerful tools. And I'm uh, very excited that as we're growing in our knowledge of the brain, I think there will be many significant advances to come. When we look back and we think, as we said, there are references of the brain in the papyrus in Egypt from uh, wars 5,000 years ago. But it wasn't until 1906 that the important stains to recognize neurons were developed. Two anatomists, a scientist, uh, won the Nobel Prize 1906 for work related to this. They were uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal and Camilo Golgi. So if we think it took about 5,000 years to get to that point, but from 1906 to where we are now, just over a century later, we're talking about sophisticated imaging studies, connectomes, neuropsychology, deep understanding of eye movements, neuroophthalmology, balance, neurotology, chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters, where we've come in just over 100 years far surpasses where we've come in 5,000 years. But we also recognize that a lot of this is due to uh, technology, information, handling of information, discovery, 
sharing of information, things like internet, other aspects, make it so much easier to advance the growth of knowledge. And certainly the growth in the last uh, century or so couldn't have occurred without that growth of the previous five 5,000 years. And uh, it would be exciting to know what happens in the next two or three centuries and where we are related to the brain and our knowledge of the nervous system and treatment of patients who have suffered injuries to the brain and have other uh, uh, concerns. In the book that I've written on traumatic brain injury, that's, there's one chapter refers to agnosias, aphasias, apraxias, and agraphias. These are subtle changes in the brain. Some of them may be disconnection syndromes. It may be just that different regions of the brain aren't communicating with each other. And although it doesn't involve a severe uh, consequence like a paralysis or so of an arm, it may be severe in its effect over time. Over time, small changes can be amplified. That might impact, uh, for instance, subtle deficits in communication and comprehension and understanding and multitasking and focusing. All of this may change a patient's life, an uh, individual's life tremendously. Although it might not immediately be recognizable, it may impact their family relationships, their marriage, their friends, their jobs, everything in life. It, they may be changed as a person. And these are important aspects for us to recognize. And as we look and we put this all together and we see the immense complexity of the brain, we realize other body parts can so-called heal. A fracture, it will, the bone will grow back over. And if it grows over, yes, you may see that there was a fracture, but the function of the bone may be almost as good as new, maybe as good. But with brain, when there's shearing and tearing of neurons, that doesn't undo itself. The brain may have some compensatory mechanisms to try to minimize, to compensate. Other areas of the brain may try to help to take over and compensate. But it's not that we can say, oh, somebody's healed. Those sheer uh, the neurons, the connections that are torn, don't untear. So we have to think about brain injury differently than we think about injury to many other parts of the body. And we can't think about it that somebody had an injury. Oh, just they're cured. It may be symptoms improved. Maybe we learn compensatory strategies. Maybe other mechanisms of healing have, hurt, have occurred. But we have to also be cognizant that at some time, healing may not completely occur. And patients and their families may have to adjust to a new normal. And those are important aspects for us and patients to recognize. They want to do everything within their power to try to heal. And that's always the goal. The goal of uh, all healthcare providers, doctors, it's a, the healing specialty. We want patients to do as well as possible. But part of it is also helping patients at some point to accept a bit of a new normal and for families to accept a new normal because normal to the patient may have changed. And we do everything we can to try to understand it, recognize it, improve what we can, imp apply as many compensatory strategies as we can, as much healing as we can, and address some of the cognitive, emotional, other issues that may impact the patient. We may at some point get various kinds of therapy, cognitive therapy involved, may have psychiatry evaluation, balance uh, treatments for uh, imbalance and dizziness. We may have neuro-ophthalmology evaluations, neuropsychological evaluations. There are many, many, many specialists that get involved when somebody has a, had a brain injury because an injury to the brain affects every part of the body or can affect every part of the body. An injury to the brain can affect every part of the body and it can affect every aspect about the patient. It can change who they are. They may not be, I've had spouses and family members tell me, this is not the person that I knew. This is not the person that I married. And in addition, the patient may sometimes not recognize the changes themselves. There's a agnosia called anosagnosia, 
where one doesn't recognize changes in themselves. It might be that, I, and I've had many a time, patients come in with their spouse, and I would ask them many details of questions about how they're feeling, how they're functioning, how they're getting along. And they may say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'd ask any changes in personality. They say no. And their spouse would look at me just shocked, saying, this is not the person that I married. This is not the person that I knew. This is a totally different person. I hear this not infrequently. And we have to also rec we have to recognize that in the diagnosis of brain injury, if there's a moderate or severe brain injury, yes, we see hemorrhages on scans. And some, if, certainly if we have paralysis of a limb, other se severe aspects of uh, injury, it's not hard to recognize and may be immediately very clear. And on some of these cases, we have to go immediately to the operating room. But when it comes to mild traumatic brain injury, we try to apply tests. Usually, CAT scan of the brain is negative. Conventional MRI may be negative. Additional sensitivities can be uh, achieved with a uh, kind of imaging called diffusion tensor imaging. There are other types. Uh, we all can, also can look at the volumes of the brain, volumetric analysis. There are other types of scanning uh, that can be applied. But ultimately, the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, and especially mild traumatic brain injury, which does represent 80% of all brain injury, is a clinical diagnosis. It's a uh, physician, a clinician, sitting with the patient, evaluating, going through questions, understanding impact on life. I usually ask a family member to come, so the patient may not recognize changes themselves, but I'd like another family member to be present that knows the patient well. It can be understanding how job is impacted, other aspects. And the ultimate diagnosis is a physician that understands this, sitting down with the patient and a family member or so, talking to them, examining them, and then reviewing imaging studies to see if there are areas that are consistent on the scans that match also what we might find clinically. And in addition, putting together all other data, putting together what initial symptoms the patient had from other treating providers, looking at any uh, results of other specialists, whether they be uh, neurootologist, neurooptimologist, neuropsychologist, psychiatrist, because as we say, it's not so straightforward that we can take an x-ray and create a diagnosis. This is a clinical diagnosis, which takes a lot of analysis and an understanding and a caring to really want to get to the root of it. And at that point, we can better recognize and try to treat. You know, I might have somebody that suffered a, a fracture of a leg. They might suffer a, fra a leg fracture. And they know they're the same person. And they will put, had a fr leg fracture, etc. But when somebody has had a brain injury, it's extremely personal because the brain is who we are. I've had people in my office um, become tearful and emotional when looking through their phone and recognizing that they're not the person they used to be. It's very hard for us to recognize that we've changed. We can no longer, we don't know that we'll ever become who we used to be. We're worried, we're anxious. It's a very, very, very tough thing for patients to go through and to recognize that. So it does take a caring group of physicians, a caring group of providers, a caring group of family members, caring group at work, caring. Patients who've had an injury need caring while their brain undergoes and does its best to undergo a healing process. So if we go historically, 3,000 years BC, about 5,000 years ago, there were references to the brain in uh, some of the uh, documents from the wars if we get to about 350 BC, Aristotle in Greece talked about uh, something he called an entelechy. He called it a vitalism. How do we translate from a mechanical physical structure 
to which has potential to actually actualizing and realizing the potential. So in other words, we have neurons, we have the lattice work, the structure of the brain, but from that, just physical structure of anatomy, how do we get to an actual person, a being? It's that vitalism that he talked about. It's entelechy, whether we want to call it a magic, a spirit, a soul. What is that life? And I can tell you that, unfortunately, I have had on many occasions had to uh, perform tests to declare brain death. And I can tell you from declaring brain death on patients, also from having personal experiences with uh, in family members that have passed away, or even from pets, there's a change when one takes that, when the brain just stops functioning that is unmistakable. When one goes from being a living, existing person to being purely a body, or in the case of the brain, a three, pound, three pounds of tissue, as opposed to a living organism, a living being. That's an unmistakable change. And what is that? That's what we're trying to get to. How do we bridge the gap between knowing the metrics of the brain, basically, the number of neurons, how they're connected, 5,000 5, uh, connections from each cell, let's say, to how does this all translate to who we are? These are the mysteries of the brain. It, in a way, it's a good thing we don't have to know how the brain works in order to use it, but we use this every day. And that's what we're going to try to focus also. How do we better understand that? How do we recognize changes, treat changes, enhance growth, enhance learning, enhance what we call neuroplasticity, changes in the brain, healing of the brain, compensation strategies of the brain? I've uh, written a textbook. It's called Traumatic Brain Injury, A Neurosurgeon's Perspective. And it gives my perspective on the brain on all, some of the topics we've discussed, on everything from consciousness to injury to scales of uh, measuring brain injury to biomarkers, the uh, pathology of injury, treatment of injury, imaging of injury, long and short-term complications, and long-term outcomes also from a socioeconomic perspective. Although I've had significant formal training, uh, the training of a neurosurgeon is like any uh, medical doctor who goes through four years of medical school. After that, I did six years of neurosurgery residency and one year of fellowship. In, uh, my fellowship was in a specialty called neurovascular and skull-based uh, surgery. So it deals with tumors and blood vessel lesions in the brain and the skull base. But I'm very grateful to my mentors for having trained me but a huge amount of my training began after my formal education finished. And I've dedicated the book also to the patients who've entrusted me with their care. I've learned so much about medicine, about injury, about patient care, and about humanity and courage and life from my patients. I've seen patients, as a neurosurgeon, I've seen patients in some of the most difficult times of their life. And I've seen tremendous courage, whether it's patients who've had a brain injury or tumors, other aspects of the brain. I've learned tremendous amount. Uh, patients often find from deep within, within them a resilience and a courage to meet the challenge and meet the difficulties. Uh, and I've learned greatly and immensely from my patients, and I'm very grateful. And as I say, the dedication in the book is to my patients that have entrusted me with their care. Mm -hmm.